first of all, thank you to everyone who has taken the time to attend our webinar um, by MedGenome, leveraging the iReceptor gateway to derive biological insights from TCR repertoire sequencing data. Um, I'm your host, Aditya Pai. I'm the VP for Corporate and Business Development at MedGenome. Uh, and I'm pr very privileged and honored to have um, three guests with us today. Uh, the first, uh, Dr. Kushal Surya Mohan, who's the Director of Bioinformatics Services at MedGenome USA. He um, leads the commercial bioinformatics services team and also sees the optimization and development of pipelines for NGS data analysis. Kushal previously worked at Genentech, where he focused on analyzing long read optical map sequencing and chromatin uh, uh, capture technology data uh, to generate high quality de novo genome assemblies. He was also involved in applying high throughput NGS based uh, functional genomic screens to, of oncogenes to characterize oncogene functions in cancer. Uh, Kushal has uh, a number of publications in high impact um, journals and holds a PhD in biochemistry and a master's in computer science from the University of Buffalo, uh, State University of uh, New York. We're also um, uh, pleased to invite uh, two guests from the iReceptor Gateway, uh, Felix Breeden, who is the scientific director of iReceptor and iReceptor Plus USA, who's a professor emeritus at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Felix was the chair of the AIRR community executive from 2015 when the AIR community was founded until 2019. He serves on the AIR community executive and common repository and diagnostics working group and is also the scientific manager of iReceptor Plus, a European Canadian consortium that is working to expand the AIRR data commons and the iReceptor gateway uh, which provides access to AIRR seq repertoires um, in the commons. Our second, our third uh, guest uh, is Brian Corey, who is the technical director of iReceptor and iReceptor Plus USA. Um, Brian is the technical manager for iReceptor Plus and the co-chair of the AIRR Common Repositories Working Group. He has a background in computer science with a focus on data, data visualization, computer science, and scientific collaboration. Um, we are in for a real treat. Um, thank you very much for to all of you for attending. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to add those questions in the Q and A, uh, and we will triage those accordingly at the end of the conversation and the webinar, and uh, try our best to give you answers. If we uh, cannot uh, get through all the questions towards the end, we'll make sure to email. Um, and we appreciate all of your time um, this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, uh, to attend. With that, I'm going to uh, request uh, Dr. Suri Mohan uh, to begin um, our conversation with um, uh, an initial overview of uh, MedGenome uh, as well as TCR repertoire sequencing. Kushal, let me pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Adi, for the introduction. Uh, so thanks again for the introduction, Adi. I'm, I'm really excited to uh, hear the uh, iReceptor Gateway um, folks talk about what they're doing and how we are working together with iReceptor essentially to leverage TCR data. Uh, but just a, a brief introduction for those who are probably not familiar with MedGenome. Um, we are a leading global uh, research uh, and diagnostics services provider, um, mainly leveraging next generation sequencing data. Uh, our labs are located in Foster City, California in the USA and uh, in Bangalore, India as well. Um, we have four main subdivisions. Uh, the first being research services where we provide uh, high quality end-to-end -end solutions for next generation sequencing projects. Uh, and this is working with top research institutions and pharma companies, both in the US and India. Uh, and in conjunction with the next generation sequencing services, we also provide uh, high-end uh, advanced analyses uh, and visualizations of these uh, different data sets. Uh, we have a genetic diagnostics wing uh, that's uh, solely focused in India, where we are the number one provider of genetic diagnostics in India with over 400, uh, uh, 400 approved genetic tests. Um, typically, we serve over 150,000 patients a year, and this number is actually doubling every year in the last few years, actually. Uh, we are a CAP-certified lab in India. And then the fourth division sort of leverages some of the access that we have to these uh, patients. Uh, and we've built the largest and deepest South Asian clinical genomic data set. Uh, we've built key collaborations with the clinicians across the country, research groups, uh, and thus have access, unprecedented access to patients across many therapeutic areas. And, and this is really uh, a goldmine for uh, discovering new uh, drug targets. We offer, uh, as I mentioned, uh, sequencing services 
uh, and the, often this is a flexible sort of end-to-end -end workflow where uh, you can come in at any point uh, along this process uh, of generating data and analyzing data, um, including uh, project uh, initiation, consultation, uh, experimental design, um, and sort of understanding what the analysis output requirements are. So we can take a variety of different samples uh, as input, prepare libraries uh, after extracting genomic material, sequencing them uh, in-house uh, where we have uh, a number of uh, sequencing instruments and then our bioinformatics team can provide um, any level of detailed analysis that we prefer. Uh, and as I mentioned, we uh, accept a different variety of uh, sample types beginning from purified DNA, RNA, um, hard to work with uh, uh, sample sources as well, such as FFPs, kids or girls, uh, frozen tissues, fixed cells, and what have you. Uh, and then we offer really a breadth of uh, next generation sequencing services, whole genome sequencing, whole exome targeted amplicon sequencing, uh, bulk RNA sequencing, and the focus of today's talk, bulk TCR sequencing, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as uh, DCR sequencing. And we've also been really uh, focusing our efforts on single cell genomics and the platform that it provides for understanding disease biology and fundamental biology. We have in-house a number of next generation sequencing platforms uh, from Illumina, as well as the 10X genomics chromium controller. Once all of this data is there, it, uh, bioinformatics plays a really powerful role in, in um, mining this data and uh, massaging the data into uh, to give more meaningful insights. And we provide a number of different analyses options uh, for the different uh, data types that are generated here. Um, as I mentioned, we're focusing on single cell genomics as well. And this has really been a push from our side. Um, and we accept a, a wide variety of sample types to process and uh, generate single cell genomics libraries. Um, there are different varieties of flavors of single cell genomics libraries and the technologies as well. In addition to the single cell genomics uh, <clears throat> offering from 10X Genomics, we also provide uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Takara single cell sequencing as well. Um, and this can really give rise to a number of different applications uh, from uh, gene expression studies uh, or uh, immune repertoire profiling. Um, and so focusing on today's uh, sort of main topic, which is immune repertoire sequencing, uh, we uh, offer end-to-end -end solutions for uh, TCR and BCR sequencing, where we accept uh, fresh and uh, flash frozen cells, FFP samples only in the case of TCR, uh, tissues or RNA, uh, both of the bulk and single cell input. Uh, we then prepare the libraries um, to a thorough QC of the samples, and then we perform the sequencing, and then we do the bioinformatics analysis as well. So uh, why is TCR and BCR sequencing uh, you know, important and at the same time challenging, right? As we know, adaptive immunity can provide uh, both acute and long-term protection against really a, a a really endless list of uh, pathogenic hazards that we face every day, right? And so to contend with these sort of th threats, the adaptive immune system relies on T cells and B cells shown here um, to create massive, you know, repertoires of uh, lymphocytes with distinct immune receptors and antigen specificities. So uh, the T cells and B cells, although they're functionally distinct, uh, and organized very really similarly, and uh, as shown here, right, where they have a heavy chain and a light chain paired, and um, both are composed of distinct subunits, the heavy chain and the light chain. Um, each chain contains a variable region. This is really the business end of the, the receptors that really can recognize antigens and, and uh, activate the immune system and the response downstream of it. Um, so going through a number of series of diversification steps where the we have a variable region uh, composed of the VDJ segments are rearranged during lymphocyte development, you end up with uh, a tremendous amount of diversity in both BCRs and TCRs. It is estimated that there are at least 10 to the 13 BCRs and about 10 to the 18 TCRs. And so how do you really get to the, uh, the crux of this diversity? How do you uh, identify and study this diversity? Um, Thankfully, there have been massive technological strides that have happened in the last decade or so in using high throughput sequencing and bioinformatics uh, algorithms to really understand um, how our body can generate such diversity. Um, 
So there are a few different ways and methods that have been devised to really understand this diversity. Uh, initially, uh, PCR amplification strategies were developed. Um, when you begin with genomic DNA and you have multiplexed PCR primers, which are really degenerate consensus primers that can target different regions of the VED or J segments. And so you would individually amplify and um, study the individual segments or the CDR3 sequences, which is the most important part of that variable domain. Um, alternatively, you can start with mRNA and using reverse transcription, you can try to uh, uh, obtain end-to-end -end sort of uh, sequencing information of the variable domain. More recently with single cell genomics, um, the, this sort of reverse transcription technology has been used, but the key difference here is as opposed to um, bulk mRNA sequencing, you cannot obtain pairing information, which is obviously very critical for understanding the diversity that's generated. But in single cell genomics, because you are encapsulating individual cells into beads and then sequencing whatever is present in that single cell, you can actually now uh, identify the pairing information. So you actually end up with paired antibody sequences. Uh, we offer both bulk and single cell immune profiling uh, services at MedGenome. In fact, we've developed uh, the ability to sequence the, the gamma delta chains of the TCRs as well. And we also developed assays for uh, studying the immune repertoire profiles of uh, species outside of human and mouse, which is what is set, uh, supported currently by the two main providers of uh, immune profiling, which is 10x Genomics and Takara Bio. Uh, besides these uh, assays, we, we also provide support for a number of different types of tissues. Uh, depending on the availability of the tissue, uh, we can go as low as uh, 50 cells really to isolate RNA. Uh, and obviously, the more cells you have, the better is your sensitivity to detect some of these uh, antibody sequences. Um, and from this, you get a variety of information, the most important being the uh, sequences of the CDR3s. And in the case of single cell TCR, you get full length paired antibody information um, or TCR sequence information. Uh, and from bulk, um, bulk mRNA sequencing, especially that provided by Takara, uh, you actually get full length uh, uh, sequences of the individual chains at least, but not the paired information. And so this is, well, this is our TCR zoo, which is what we call because we've now developed uh, assays uh, and the analysis workflow for actually uh, profiling the TCRs of a number of species uh, outside of human and mouse, including the rhesus monkey, chicken, rabbit, um, and rat. And this really supports uh, a number of applications uh, downstream of TCR analysis, including drug discovery and development and vaccine trials. And once we have the data, we can then uh, perform a comprehensive bioinformatic analysis. Uh, and the way we deliver our analysis is through this MedGenome Analytics platform, which is a, a, a platform that we've built, which is a framework for incorporating multiple uh, bioinformatics techniques uh, to really generate um, uh, comprehensive reports that the end user can then use to derive uh, any meaning or insight into the data. And so this is typically how a report would look like where all of the bioinformatics analysis is compiled into a single comprehensive report, uh, including you know, detailed information and statistics about the data, as well as plots that help in uh, understanding the data better. Um, for our TCR and BCR sequencing analysis, uh, we uh, provide a number of different uh, analysis outputs. This includes the most critical information being the full length chronotype sequences, uh, pairing information if it is single cell sequencing, um, uh, as well as the frequency of these chronotypes, uh, which allows us to see if they're clonally expanding chronotypes present in the population, uh, as well as a lot of interactive visualizations, uh, including um, correlation plots to see if two samples uh, have similar CDR3 sequences, uh, what is the VJ gene sharing pattern between uh, sequences or within samples. Uh, and I'm just gonna show you a few examples of you know, what the outputs look like and how this can really help us understand the data better. The uh, first thing here you see is a heat map that shows the V and J gene usage patterns uh, across samples. Uh, you also have Shannon diversity scores that tell you how diverse your repertoire is uh, in terms of the TCR chronotypes or the PCR chronotypes really. And once you have uh, enriched uh, chronotypes that are expanding, you can then see if there's similarities in their motifs in the CDR3 usage patterns. 
You can also uh, represent heat maps in the form of circus plots, which gives you a better pictorial representation of, you know, between samples. In this case, you have one sample that's uh, received a stimulant A, and there's a same sample that's received uh, a stimulant B. And you can see that the same DRB gene is actually expanding, um, which probably means that this is uh, responding to the stimulus. And so this plot is really helpful in understanding clonal expansion of particular TCRs and uh, their preferences for V and J genes. This plot here shows sharing patterns of clonotypes between samples. So this is a pairwise correlation plot that shows here in red clonotypes that are actually shared between two samples, whereas the blue represent clonotypes that are still present or detected only in this sample. The gold dots here represent chronotypes detected only in this sample. And so this is again very useful to see um, any shared patterns of chronotypes. We can also track chronotypes uh, across samples uh, and across time as well. So you can do longitudinal tracking of chronotypes, uh, especially in, in therapy um, or drug treatment uh, studies. And then you can see relative clonal homeostasis, where you can see uh, if particular samples have expanding clusters of clonotypes. So uh, I'll, I'll stop at that and, and really uh, sort of emphasize that there are now high throughput sequencing methods and bioinformatics analysis methods that allow us to really um, perform a deep dive into immune uh, profiling and understand the, the diversity of the immune repertoire. Single cell genomics now allow us to obtain uh, uh, paired information for these uh, TCRs and BCRs. Uh, but with the amount of data that's being generated, uh, the ability to analyze, analyze, annotate, and curate these sequences is a challenge. Uh, given the enormous diversity, uh, there's actually a scarcity of the, uh, the well-annotated, curated data on these uh, T-cell or B-cell specificities. And really, the, the goal here would be to curate this data to that will really allow us to understand diseases and adaptive immunity. Just a few example cases would be, you know, once you have these TCRs uh, curated, you could then search for uh, repertoires that satisfy certain conditions that you're looking for. For example, you want to find if uh, a TCR that you found in your study is also present in uh, other studies and maybe you're interested in ovarian cancer and you want to see if they're found in other ovarian cancer studies too. Um, you could alternatively search for um, specific CDR3 sequences based on your input and see where else they're found, what other disease areas are they found in. And so uh, that is uh, sort of really the crux and the heart of the, the issue uh, that we're facing here. And I think iReceptor Gateway is uh, one of the organizations that's leading this effort to curate and annotate uh, TCRs. And so I'm going to stop here and allow uh, the folks from iReceptor to, to uh, showcase what they're doing recently. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Kushal. Um, uh, this is, uh, just sets the stage for uh, Brian and Felix, uh, starting with Felix, to go through uh, the iReceptor gateway and how, um, by having all this information and annotation and curation ability in one, uh, one place, how this can facilitate and uh, help uh, researchers derive uh, biological insights. Uh, so Felix, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to, to continue. Great. Yeah, yeah, thanks, um, Adi, and uh, I'm Felix Braden, the Scientific Director of iReceptor, iReceptor Plus, and thanks to MedGenome for inviting us to discuss how we can answer some of the questions that Kashal um, brought up so effectively. And uh, I'm gonna take uh, kind of the bigger picture and talk about the adaptive immune system and what we call the AIR community, the adaptive immune receptor repertoire community um, talk about why we felt we needed this community to develop standards and protocols for sharing and curating these type of data. And then this led to the Air Data Commons and um, the iReceptor Gateway. And then Brian will talk about the more um, details of the iReceptor Gateway that can query this Air Data Commons. So just a uh, just little discussion of the adaptive immune system because um, Really, the, the one question is, well, why do we need a new initiative, you know, another genomics initiative looking at complex genomic data and health issues? Well, the adaptive immune system does um, uh, bring about specific challenges, antibodies and B cells and T cells receptors that we, we call air seek data, adaptive immune receptor repertoire data. 
highly variable, as Kishal mentioned, has to recognize both uh, bacteria and viruses, um, and all pathogens, but also the expressed self proteins and not attack those and bases of vaccines, drugs and suppressing immune diseases, new cancer immunotherapies. So highly um, relevant to all these diseases. Um, why do we need a platform specific to AirSeq data? So AirSeq data, kind of the summary are difficult to share and compare. We talked about the size of the data sets. Um, there's the potential um, in the human population, this huge potential number of diverse receptors in the human population, but each individual can have up to 10 to the ninth B cells and T cells. They may not all be unique, but a large number of them are unique. And the studies every week or so, you have another study with a couple hundred million B cell receptors or T cell receptors. So the data is, as Kishal mentioned, just huge. Um, here's another showing the VDJ recombination. Again, this is one of the ways to produce this diversity, but it's, I think it's also important to um, reflect on how unique this process is in the eukaryote genome. This uh, recombination along the germline to pro start producing these diverse clones, the T cell receptor and immunoglobulin germline genes are the only genes in the eukaryote genome that um, undergoes this process. And so this unique process demands um, unique ways of curating the data, unique ways of analyzing the data. It's important to sequence the receptors, but then understand how they, uh, how they developed from this initial recombination event. And then in terms of B cell receptors, uh, mutated as they adapted to the um, pathogens and so this is one reason that um, you, you really get a unique challenge when you start talking about these immune receptors. Also, if you think about all the different ways that the, all the different steps to producing these data, each um, lab and each uh, uh, scientist will, will um, have different, slightly different ways of um, producing these data, different tissues, different ways of sequencing the immune receptors, different ways of analyzing the, annotating the receptors. And so each of these, again, makes it hard to share and compare in, um, these types of data. And then finally, uh, to make these data important, you need data on patient demography, treatment, clinical outcome, have complex analyses with the unique bioinformatic tools, and there's possibility of personnel identification on these data. So all of these um, challenges are um, very relevant to looking at the, um, what we call AirSeq data, B cell receptor repertoires and T cell receptor repertoires. So that led us to um, start this initiative called the Adaptive Immune Receptor Repertoire Community. It's a global grassroots, um, community and has immunologists, bioinformaticians, um, experts in legal issues and um, uh, uh, IP issues and computer experts. And we really feel that the, uh, one of the goals is, is, is developing common protocols for curating, storing, uh, analyzing and sharing these data. And that this is really important to optimally using these data because you can increase your sample sizes, um, statistical power, the AI approaches, which are very popular right now, demand these huge sample sizes and different people, you can use different um, data sets as controls or searching for uh, kind of reiterating your patterns that you might see in your data. So that was the goal of the adaptive immune receptor repertoire. The guts of the air community are the working groups. And this lists some of the working groups. We have minimal standards, which was one of the first things we did, which was developing a set of minimal metadata standards for publishing or depositing AirSeq data. And this is really what drives what Brian will be talking about, the air, the iReceptor um, platform, because if we have multiple repositories storing these data, but if they store the data according to these um, shared agreed upon standards, well then um, you can query these data and understand you know, what, um, where the data are and how the data are formatted. 
Um, data representation working group is expanding to include single cell air seek and gene expression data. Software working group, very important in terms of interoperability of the analysis software. Common repository is the one that has developed the data commons, which is what the iReceptor gateway um, queries and where we, we want people and we're hoping people will uh, um, put their publicly available data. Oh, and then finally, the germline database, as Kashal mentioned, with getting into the non-human um, models uh, and also with human models, very important to understand the germline in as much data we can to have proper reference data sets to uh, examine the, the expressed repertoires against. And just to kind of reiterate how the air community works, it's really through the working groups, they develop standards. And then these standards are published in um, major journals. And that really is how we um, uh, produce our standards and, and explain them to the world basically. And all of these publications must be ratified by the full air community. So that kind of shows how this really is a grassroots community initiative that um, brings all these groups together and all these groups have to agree on the standards before they become um, a standard that we put out to the, to the community. And then before I hand it over to Brian, we just wanted to mention a few, you could call them use cases or just impress you know, why these data can be so important to um, health and disease. I like this slide from chronic lymphocytic leukemia because it's such a dramatic example of the differences on the right, we have a healthy don donor, on the left, we have a, a, a patient with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And it shows the expansion of clones on the, in a healthy donor, each of the gray blobs is a cluster of sequences that are inferred to come from the same B cell clone in this case is then on the left with CLL, a few clones have greatly over um, grown. And then the treatment would be to try to um, get rid of these clones and replace the, the, the um, repertoire with a healthy repertoire. Minimal residual disease is, is trying to watch for those cancer associated clones in the patient. And the FDA has approved biotechnologies clone seek test for minimal residual disease. So this shows that these air seek data are becoming um, you know, involved or you know, are, are critical to these um, FDA approved uh, clinical tests. And I think more and more of these type of tests will be developed as we understand the importance of these types of data in health and disease. Uh, working with MedGenome, we're thinking that um, uh, a really important unmet need will be for looking at T cell receptor clonotypes in immune checkpoint blockade. Um, here's an example in metastatic, metastatic melanoma from Fairfax et al. in Nature Medicine 2020. So they had patients that were treated with anti-PD-1 or alone or including with anti-CTL4A. So this is the idea that these immune checkpoints release the adaptive immune system to start attacking the um, the tumors or the cancer. And this has been, I'm sure most know, a, a huge advance in cancer immunotherapy. But one of the mysteries is that it often only maybe a quarter of patients will respond um, positively to these immunotherapies. When they do respond, it's an incredible response, but often uh, it's only a small proportion or a, a, a maybe 25% of the patients that actually respond. So this is an example showing how important the T cell uh, receptor clonality can be. On the left, we have um, control individuals, uh, patients that progressed with the disease, and then patients on the right that were, had a good response to the immunotherapy. Um, and this is the, just the um, peripheral um, um, blood uh, analysis. And it's at day 21, which is very important. So this is day 21 that predicted who's responding and who's not responding or characterizing who's responding and not responding. And then as we see in the right-hand figure, this um, expansion of T cell receptor clones at day 21 actually predicts progression-free survival 
for next, you know, many, many months. So this is one indication that again, this, these characteristics of the T cell repertoire may be important diagnostic tools that actually can direct um, treatment in these individuals. And then uh, just um, kind of the overall uh, results from this, they had gene expression, uh, they included single cell um, and gene expression from these single cells. And basically they were able to look into these large clones, these expanded clones and ask, you know, what was unique about them? And they saw that it was a uniquely cytotoxic profile. So it allowed them to also look at the physiology of the cells that were producing these clones. And then finally, the, um, as Brian will talk about, we've done a major um, curation effort about COVID-19 patients. We have a repository specifically for COVID-19 patient data, 20 studies, uh, thousands of repertoires, over a billion rearrangements. And looking at T cell clone types, we have some different patterns here. Um, you see very stereotypical immune response with convergence TCR clonotypes in these different um, uh, studies on COVID-19 patients. And again, adaptive biotechnology is the second FDA approved uh, COVID test for prior infections. Pre-existing immunity in unexposed individuals showing that these clones were often around before they were then um, expanded under the, the uh, natural infections. Um, probably the most important one is the third study here from Hemming et al. They called it NeuroCOVID or these long haulers with neurological defects. And in this case, the, the researchers took seven different studies from um, queried from the iReceptor um, COVID-19 repository and showed that there was strong T cell expansion in these long um, haulers. And then one other question that you can do is um, bias V gene usage. T cell receptors were using particular types of uh, genes in these um, inflammatory patients in this example. So this shows kind of the overall these patterns that you can see in these data and characterizes diagnostic possibilities, but the importance of looking at um, other data sets to test these patterns and to look for how many of these clonotypes are common versus um, private and those sort of questions that Kashal brought up. So that's kind of the bigger picture of the AIR community, um, developing the AIR data commons. And then Brian will talk about the uh, eye receptor um, gateway and the kind of the guts of the eye receptor gateway and how it can query these, um, these, these studies. Excellent. Thank you so much, Felix. Uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, going through that information. And I'm going to um, invite Brian uh, to continue uh, with specifically the eye receptor gateway and going into the cuts of, of what it is. And of course, thank you very much again, Brian, for your time. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Felix. Uh, thanks, Kushal. Yeah, so I'm going to uh, start where Felix left off and uh, dive into a little bit on the air data commons, but not too much and then dive into the eye receptor gateway in a fair bit of detail. So just a bit more detail on the air data commons. So kind of the air community vision, um, partially driven by the size of these data sets, um, is that it really makes sense to have a distributed data commons rather than a single large repository. It's just not really practical to store the scale of data that we're talking about in a single big repository. And so the Air Data Commons is basically the vision of an international network of distributed repositories. Um, currently, there are four repositories only, so, but we envision that this is going to grow pretty dramatically over the next little while. We've been talking to a number of groups. Uh, we expect uh, probably that to double in, in size in the not too distant future um, is the, certainly the hope. Um, and Critically, what Felix mentioned is these repositories are all based on standards developed by the Air community. Um, so there's the Meyer standard, there's a file format standard for data sharing, there's the Air Data Commons Web API, which is probably the most important from an Air Data Commons perspective, um, because it is what provides the ability to query each of these repositories with the same type, type of query and get data in an Air compliant format back from those repositories. So the iReceptor gateway. So I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking more specifically about the iReceptor gateway and what it does and how it can be used. So the iReceptor gateway is basically a, a web-based data discovery, exploration, and analytics platform. Um, so it's basically a web portal. So you sit in front of your web browser 
and you issue queries. So it kind of hides the complexity of the fact that you're sending queries to repositories all around the world. So you send out a query, it goes to all of the repositories, the data comes back from those repositories, and the iReceptor gateway presents, prevent, presents that data to the end user. And I'll show some examples of the gateway in a second. Talk a little bit more about the Air Data Commons. Um, Felix mentioned this, but I'll just dive into it a little bit more uh, detail. So there are currently 60 studies with over 4 billion curated annotated sequences. Um, and I say curated, when I say curated, I mean valuable. And what I mean by that is that those, uh, those sequences have gone through a processing pipeline that is quite complex to provide uh, fully annotated sequences. So it's not just the sequence that you're uh, storing in the repository, but you're storing the metadata about the study and how the study was done, as well as all of the uh, actual sequence annotations. So the VDJ genes, the CDR3s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, the, the processing that's performed on the data that's in the Air Data Commons is quite substantial. And that's really what makes that data valuable. Felix also mentioned the COVID-19, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about how that has evolved. Um, you'll see in the diagram uh, when the COVID-19 repositories were added. Um, and I'd just kind of like to point out that this, uh, this is a very broad and fast adoption of using AirSeq data in the Air Data Commons um, to perform studies. So in May 2020, or uh, 2020, uh, Nielsen L at L uh, published the first preprint on AirSeq with AirSeq COVID-19 data. That data was available in the Air Data Commons, so it was curated and annotated um, by June 2020. One of the key goals of the Air Data Commons and the iReceptor platform is to make it easy to reuse data and just kind of walk through a little bit more of a use case. Um, there's a Schultes et al. paper that uh, if you're interested in COVID-19 and AirSeq data, you're probably aware of it. It was one of the first studies that had COVID-19 data uh, across multiple time points for many patients. It was published in Immunity in June, of 29, uh, June 29th, 2020. Um, we worked actually with that, the Schultes and Binder group um, to uh, load that data into their data comments, and it was available in their data comments by July 7th. By September 2020, that data had already been uh, downloaded, reused, and a further paper published using that data. And in January 2021, um, Felix mentioned the Hemming et al. paper. Um, that actually uh, reused seven different data sets from seven different studies of COVID-19 patients. So you can see from June to January, um, a single study was basically reused by several other researchers um, to further uh, advance their research and get further publications. So that data reuse is really the goal of the Air Data Commons and the iReceptor platform in particular. Just want to talk a little bit about use of the iReceptor gateway. So we've been in uh, production um, for a fair number of years now. So we're probably about five years of full production. Um, and what the thing, one of the things I wanted to point out is uh, the use of over the last uh, year and a bit. This is partially driven certainly by COVID-19. Um, this is a graph of the number of users added per month. You can see we're kind of between, I don't know, 10, 15 users per month before uh, COVID hit. In June 2000, uh, 2020, um, that's when the first uh, COVID-19 paper, and you can see that the spike of new users, the interest in actually using the Air Data Commons and our receptor platform jumped dramatically and has, and has remained high since that time. Um, in terms of uh, who's using it and where they're using it from, um, I think it's pretty important to point out that it's actually a very international community that's using it. So we have a large number of users from North America, Europe, and Asia. One of the interesting things that I think is, is quite compelling about the value of this is that we actually have a fair number of commercial users. So um, users from uh, biotech companies in the industry. So we have over 62 new users in the last, uh, in the last year um, from commercial companies. So what are the users doing on the gateway? Um, we have lots of visitors and lots of data downloads. And again, uh, you can see the spike driven by the COVID-19 data availability. 
Um, and so the uh, blue line that you can see there is basically the number of visitors to the actual web portal or web gateway um, as a measure. And then the orange line is the uh, amount of data that is downloaded. And you can see a very, very dramatic increase, in particular the data downloads um, as to how much it has scaled up uh, since the COVID-19 data has been available. So what does it mean to use the receptor gateway? So I'm gonna kind of just walk people quickly through um, kind of how you would use the receptor gateway. I'm gonna go pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Um, the gateway is basically a web portal. The URL for it is up here in the right-hand corner. And essentially a user just logs in. I'm gonna flip through these pretty quickly just to give you a bit of an idea for a workflow. There's basically two workflows, um, the sequence quick search. I think um, Kushal mentioned you know, searching for a specific CDR3. So you can actually put a junction or a CDR3 amino acid sequence and search all 4 billion sequences and all 60 studies for that CDR3. I'm gonna talk about the repertoire metadata search in a bit more detail, which is um, searching across study metadata. I'm gonna use the COVID-19 as a kind of a, a simple case study. Um, so if you, it's quite easy to just narrow down from 4 billion sequences down to uh, the billion sequences that are in COVID-19. That uh, COVID-19 data is spread across three remote repositories um, and across 15 research labs and 21 studies. If you want to look in detail at a single repertoire, um, it's pretty easy to get uh, summary stats. This is a, basically a simple summary of the um, the, the repertoire that you're looking at. You look at VD, VD, J gene, and junction length amino acid stats. And if you want, you can drill down into specifics of a specific V gene if you want. I won't show that in detail. And once you find a sequence or a repertoire of interest, you can kind of look at all of the, all of the sequences at once, or you can look at the sequences from a single repertoire. I'm going to go look at the sequences from a single repertoire. And at that point, you can see actual the actually gene annotations or sequence annotations for that repertoire. So you see the V gene, the D gene, the J gene, the CDR3, junction length, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can filter on uh, sequence uh, annotation uh, features. So you can look for specific CDR3s. You can look for specific V genes if you're interested. And you can download uh, all of the data for further analysis if you want. So basically the platform allows you to um, scan, search, find, and download uh, data sets uh, across the entire Air Data Commons. So that's where we are today. I'm just going to talk a couple minutes about where things are going in the future because I think that is really, I think, probably the interesting overlap with kind of where we're at with uh, kind of our work with through iReceptor and iReceptor Plus and uh, our work with MedGenome. So one of the things that we're trying to, uh, to move towards is uh, rather than download uh, sequences and do offline analysis, we really want to empower people to do um, analysis application, run analysis applications, uh, complex analysis applications from within the iReceptor gateway itself. So the data never really leaves the gateway and the platform and the data stays within the platform and the user doesn't have to manage analysis tools and do the bioinformatics themselves. So I'm just gonna, uh, it's not intended that you're able to read this. I'm just gonna kind of give you an idea for, uh, for the workflow. So essentially what I've done here is I've cho chosen an analysis app and I basically run a job, so to speak. What that basically does when you run an analysis pipeline Gateway does an enormous amount of work for you as a user on your behalf. So it federates the data from the R data commons. So you're, if you're looking for COVID-19 data, if you're looking at T cell data only, it will federate that data for you. It'll transfer that data to, to a computation resource. It'll run that analysis, which is potentially a very long running analysis, very computationally expensive. And when it's done, it'll transfer the user results to the gateway. So once you get your results, Essentially, that is basically an analysis output uh, that consists of a lot of visualizations and, and potential uh, analysis files that you can use further in your analysis. So we're trying to uh, explore this area pretty, uh, pretty actively right now. So we'd be really interested in hearing from people and what they're, uh, what they're interested in doing with these repertoires. 
Um, we're working on integration of a widely set of tool suites, um, looking at repertoire characterization. So Kushal talked about a lot of these things, general statistics, diversity metrics, mutation analysis, clonal evolution, doing clonotype analysis, single cell analysis, and genotype inferences. And we're looking at integrating some of the widely used tools. So uh, many of you may be aware of the incantation tool set. It's a very, very powerful set of tools that does a lot of the repertoire characterization and clonotype analysis. Um, VDJ Base is one of our partners in the, developed by one of the groups, one of our partners in the Receptor Plus project, and that does genotype inference. Um, and again, I, I would be interested in hearing about what people uh, want to do from an analysis perspective. And uh, last but not least, so I've been talking a lot about the iReceptor gateway and how the end user uses it, um, but what do you do if you have data that you want to share? So part of the Air Data Commons model is that labs and groups run their own repositories. One of the things we're also working on is making that easy for users to do as well. Um, so if you have AirSeq data that you want to manage and share, um, we have a, pack, a platform called iReceptor Turnkey, which is a set of uh, Docker containers. Apologize if I start to use jargon at this point, um, but it makes basically makes it simple and easy to install and run an error compliant repository that adheres to all of the error standards. Um, one of our other partners is VDJ Server. Um, they have a platform where you can upload your sequence data, uh, run that data through their analysis pipeline and publish it to the error data commons as well. And that is it for me. So I'd just like to thank uh, our colleagues in the ERA community and our collaborators on the various funded projects. Um, we couldn't have done this without you. We'll open things up for questions and I'll just leave it with a set of useful references. I think these slides will be available so you can get this uh, information offline as well, I'm sure. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, Felix, Kushal, uh, for uh, 50 minutes of um, what was really depicting <clears throat> an end-to-end -end process where you can begin with sequencing, continue with um, advanced analysis of VCR, TCR data, and essentially analyze it and, and then actively use um, the iReceptor gateway um, as a one-stop shop for what is an incredible amount of work. Uh, with uh, international collaborators who have contributed to sequencing, as well as the high compute power that goes into uh, making it easy for a researcher to access this data. Uh, we have um, a, a couple of questions that have been asked in the background, and I'll go in the order of those. Um, certainly from a slides perspective, we'll have a recording of this made available to all of you uh, who have uh, registered, and so you will receive a, a recording. Uh, it'll take a few days just for us to edit it a little bit uh, to make sure that um, the start where we are kind of troubleshooting and making sure everybody's online uh, is not part of that recording, but uh, we'll uh, send that over to you as soon as possible. The first question so, was... So, Adi, could I, yes. I break in? Sorry, because I, I just looking at one question, I realized I didn't emphasize enough how, I mean, I yeah. talked about their community being an open initiative, but... Uh, yeah. Brian has it right there. One way to contact is the aircommunity.org. We're very open to people who want to work in these working groups. We're going to have our uh, general meeting, I think, starting December 8th down in La Jolla. So face-to-face um, -face and hybrid. So yeah, we're, we really encourage people to contact us and get involved in the community. Absolutely, Felix. That's a great Thank point. You. And reiterating um, uh, exactly your points that you made earlier about the um, openness and uh, the availability of, uh, of this data uh, that has been uh, so carefully um, cataloged as well. <clears throat> so the, one of the first questions was around the Mango pipeline um, that Kushal uh, depicted and whether it includes BCR data analysis. And uh, really the answer to that is, and I'll answer it and then Kushal, you can please uh, feel free to add to that. Uh, we use the Mango platform, which was internally developed to share uh, the analysis that our bioinformatics team does uh, it can be just data that we receive as a group uh, from a, a, a customer, client, partner um, that is already sequenced data, uh, or it could be um, essentially cells or DNA or RNA that we sequence uh, on which we do the analysis. Once that analysis is done, we share a link uh, to the Mango portal, and that allows uh, customers to visualize the data with, with the visualization that Kushal depicted and showed, as well as the data, and has the and you have the ability then to download that data. Um, and use it the way you want. Kushal, I don't know if you want to add anything more to that. 
No, I think you you pretty much covered it, Adi. And I also want to add in that there are now algorithms that allow us to detect TCRs and BCRs from bulk RNA sequencing data. So it does not have to be um, data that's been in uh, or libraries that have been enriched for TCRs or BCRs. So we also offer that as a service now. Absolutely. And a number of these pipelines have also been standardized. It can be RNA, uh, DNA, whole genome, whole exome, bulk BCR, TCR, single cell BCR, TCR, um, five prime, three prime gene expression, all of that can, is, is included. Uh, a, a next question uh, was to Felix, and uh, this was around the correlation with microbiome and the response of patients. And Felix, would you like to just uh, comment on that? I know you uh, messaged uh, the, the person asking this question, but maybe you can just for the benefit of the rest of the group um, answer that um, question as well. Yeah, sure. I uh, we also have Christian Bussa on the, as a, one of the participants, who's one of the major people in the Air community in the IR Plus consortium. Uh, I mean, right now, I guess the Air community hasn't addressed microbiome explicitly. We know that it's important. Um, as I said in my answer, there's a, there's several different initiatives looking at systems immunology, trying to bring all these types of data together. As we expand in the single cell, we get the gene expression data. Um, and, and then I, I could mention that uh, Jamie Scott, one of our founders of the AIR community, is working with IUIS, the International Union of Immunological Societies, to look at big data in immunology and basically take the kind of gr grassroots approach to standards and metadata standards and protocols that the AIR community has developed. But um, expand it to multiple types of immunological data. Um, so that would be one initiative that, that is trying to bring all these different types of immunological data together into common uh, standards and protocols uh, to promote again, sharing and reuse and interoperability of analysis and everything like that. So I'm, I'm imagining there's others, but uh, that's one that, you know, I can, I know I can, you know, know about is the IUIS effort at, um, in big data and in immunology. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. There was a question that I think has already been answered around how you get involved in AIR and share mm -hmm. and use access data sets. So the simplest way uh, for Brian and Felix is to just send an email to support at iReceptor.org and request access. Um, and of course, if you want to share data to please contact uh, Brian uh, and um, and Felix, uh, they're very keen to help research groups get their mm -hmm. own repositories up and running. Yeah, we have a lot of support for that. Really, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, a question was around, uh, can NLP-based knowledge base help uh, to, um, to, I guess, increase TCR information? Um, I don't know, Kushal, Brian, Felix, if you want to take a crack at it, right, in terms of specific NLP-based knowledge bases that you're aware of, or is, are, are some of these already included in um, what other people are contributing, right, if there's an NLP-based approach already in play, I, I give it up to you to answer that. I mean, there are certainly groups that are looking at uh, kind of machine learning to use for classification, um, and in a way they're using Natural, nat, natural language processing in, a, in an, I guess, an odd way <laughs> um, to infer or classify um, kind of repertoires and whether they can be uh, classified with, to indicate um, conditions like having disease and not having disease and things like that. Um, there's a paper that's just about to come out called uh, ImmuneML, which is a machine learning platform um, for uh, processing uh, air repertoires that uh, people might be interested in. Um, it's uh, being in final review at the moment. Um, so that should be out very soon. I'm sh there are others. I'm just not quite as knowledgeable about those. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add there. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. I, might, I might add too that uh, I think, I mean, one of the things about these air seek data in the uh, air data commons is just a huge amount of data. So I think, you know, it will be attractive to people looking at machine language or uh, artificial intelligence. It's a, a great place to get these huge data sets that are necessary to test some of these ideas. Excellent. 
Uh, another question, which is, <clears throat> I think, very pertinent around uh, specifically uh, security, right? What steps are being taken by a receptor to keep data uh, uh, secure, and whether it's contributors of data or the overall security of the system? Do you want me to answer that one, Felix? I definitely think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's a there's a couple uh, of fronts there. So um, through the iReceptor Plus project, we have a uh, work package that is working. So right now, uh, the iReceptor turnkey and our repositories are open data, um, and there are there is not a security layer. Um, but through iReceptor Plus, uh, we hope to have essentially a security layer where the data steward can essentially control. Um, access at the user level, as well as actually level um, at the study and even field within a study level. So for example, if your ethics say that you can share uh, repertoire metadata, but you can't uh, share gender and, um, and ethnicity, for example, you can control access to those fields and limit their exposure to only those people that have uh, permission to get access to them. So that's one of the things we're working on. Um, and the other thing that we're working on is, uh, you know, we recognize that quite often uh, researchers need to have, they have data that they can share and they have data that they can't share. Um, and so one of the ways that we're supporting that is, um, you know, we suggest people it's uh, it's pretty easy to run these repositories. Um, that's a relative statement, but it's pretty easy. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're suggesting people do is they, you can run multiple repositories, uh, one with public data, one with private data. Um, and then you can run your the same analyses across those two data sets. Um, using the same queries and using the same analysis tools. So you get the win there of having both data sets, both the public and private data sets um, in the same format, basically adhering to the air standards. Uh, and then it's possible, although this is something that we haven't uh, really support in production, um, but it's possible to run essentially your own iReceptor Gateway web portal um, internally on an internal firewall network. Um, and so that's something that we're that we're working on. We don't support uh, really at the moment from a user perspective, but if people are interested in that, we'd be interested in hearing about those use cases. Um, and that's so you can search internally the entire Air Data Commons and your private data net data sets on your private network. Um, and you don't necessarily expose your private data to the public world. Um, it also makes it easy when you're ready to share that private data essentially at the flip of a firewall switch uh, or a networking switch, you basically can add that data to the public repository as well. Um, so it's very easy to transition from public data or from private data, which is maybe not published yet, to public data after publication. Thank you. Um, I think we are uh, just uh, one minute past the hour. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, presentation webinar. And I hope all of you benefited from, um, from uh, the expertise that uh, Brian and Felix um, uh, you know, captured with uh, AIR, as well as the iReceptor Gateway, as well as um, the prelude to that, which would be analysis that can be performed on TCR, BCR type data, whether it's at the single cell level or the bulk level, um, and the sequencing efforts that um, happen uh, preceding that. Uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to email those to us. If uh, there are ways you want us to improve these webinars, that's also uh, something that we'd be very open to listen to. Um, you will all get a recording of this, as I mentioned earlier. And um, again, wish to thank uh, Felix, Brian, Kushal for their contributions, their time, and to all of you for taking the time out of your day, whether it's morning, evening, or e morning, afternoon, or evening, and spending that time with us. Uh, thank you very much. Have a great day and be safe. Yeah, great. Thanks to Med Genome for setting this up and inviting us to meet with you guys. You're most welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thank you.